Good morning, everybody. I said good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Before I jump into today's message, what an amazing worship experience. Can we give it up for Jessica, the team? Wow. I just, I just wanted to keep going. I don't know about you guys. I don't know if you're watching online and you felt what we felt here in this house. But let me tell you, it was powerful. And uh, I almost, I'm tempted to not even preach. I guess I have to. So if you're just joining us today, we're in a message series called Staying in Love. And uh, I know people on the way out last week were asking me um, where they could watch or listen to the previous week's messages. And let me encourage you, our team does a, a great job in posting the messages um, every week, usually by Monday, on YouTube, on our app. You can watch the video sermon. You can download the podcast and listen to it on the way to work. Or you can re-watch the entire worship experience on demand after, I think it's after 1 o'clock p.m. So there are so many ways to stay connected. So if you're, if you're just joining us today, you missed one or, one or two of the messages, uh, don't worry about it. Just go back online. I know it's going to be a blessing to you and for you. And uh, that's why, you know, that's what our team does, works really hard to get you the content. Last week I talked to you about the marriage mirror. Yes? How many enjoy the marriage mirror? Looking in the mirror. Reflecting Christ to one another, our marriage is a reflection of God's love to the world. Well, today, I want to talk to you about marriage killers. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about things that can kill your marriage. And if I were to come up with a list of marriage killers, how many know we would come up with about 20 things off the bat, like lack of communication, finances, you know, all of these things we can list on all these marriage killers. Today I want to talk to you about one. That's all I have time for. One marriage killer, which I think is probably one of the most important marriage killers. The marriage killer that's the root of all killers. I believe one of the biggest marriage killers is unresolved anger. Unresolved anger. Today I want to talk to you about how to resolve your anger in marriage. Before I begin, let me ask you, what gets you angry? What got you angry this morning? What gets you angry during the week? Well, to begin with, what gets me really angry, what gets me triggered is when people tailgate me. How about you guys? I don't know what it is about people that tailgate me, but it just annoys me. It gets me mad. Road rage, right? It's a real thing. I don't get road rage. I don't flip birds. I flip crosses. (laughs) Evil face. What gets me mad is when I go to the Starbucks line. You know I got to bring in coffee sometime and send in the message, but this time it's Starbucks. You know, you put down your window. There's only three people online. It takes 20 minutes. Why? That's because the person in front of you is, can I have... A venti latte, soy milk, two pumps of this and one pump of that. I'm about to give you a pump in a minute if you don't make this order quick. Just annoys me, long lines. Does that get you mad when people in front of you just take their time, they're oblivious? we got places to go, things to do, people to see. You know what gets me mad and gets me angry it is when I call a bill company and I get robots. How about you? Does that get you mad? Like, I'm paying you money, and that just, just, just gets me so mad that I have to speak to three robots before I speak to a person. You know what also gets me mad? This is a little bit about me. I have to share a little bit about myself. Is when I wash my car, you know, week one, my wife told you about how I like to keep my car clean. But I hate it when, when I wash my car. I get so mad, and it rains. That gets me mad. I'm like, because I love a clean car. I just love it. What gets you mad? But let me get you a little little step further. What gets you mad with your spouse? Confession time. (laughs) It's awfully quiet. What makes you become resentful? What makes you angry? What gets you upset? What gets you triggered? What gets you reactive in marriage? 
Confession time. That's why I hate preaching. Because you got to bring your story to the table. And sometimes you got to be honest. And this is the thing. I know most people think I have a perfect marriage, but I don't. I know that's a shocker. You know, if only my wife saw things my way and did things the way I wanted her to do it and believed the same things I believe, we would have a happy marriage. We'd have no arguments. But she continues to have her own thoughts, ideas, and I'm glad she does. <laughs> a few months ago, a couple months ago, we had our last argument was over garbage. And uh, me and the boys, you know, she's got three grown men literally in the house right now. I'll pray for my wife. And we're just packing the garbage in. And each one of us was responsible for the garbage. And we kind of just pack it deeper and push it down so we don't have to take the garbage out. And uh, one day my wife was just irritated. None of us took the garbage out. So she pulled the bag out. And guess what? Garbage everywhere. Yep. Garbage everywhere. And she doesn't yell. She doesn't scream. She just simply says in her own way, you guys, and she told us what you guys should have been doing. And I heard you guys from the kitchen. I was in the living room chilling and just relaxing. And when I heard you guys, I got triggered. And I said, oh, no, she did it. In my mind, I'm like, she didn't just call me you guys. I'm not you guys. I'm the king of this house. I'm the high priest of this home. I'm pastor. But at home, I'm you guys. So you didn't call me you guys. And something in me got triggered. I got annoyed. I got frustrated. And I said, well, it's not you guys. Who are you calling you guys? You guys. And then we began to argue over garbage. Have you guys ever had those garbage arguments? Like you argue over garbage just garbage stuff, garbage issues, things that really don't matter. So I became disrespectful, and um, I recognized that the issue was with my response to her. I felt triggered. I became defensive, and I realized that that wasn't the right way to respond. So after I proved my point and got my way, I cleaned up the garbage. She left the kitchen. I says, I got this. I got this. I cleaned it up, and I realized... How disrespectful I was. A little while later, I had to apologize. I hate apologizing. How about you? I had to apologize. But I just didn't apologize to her. I apologized in front of my boys. And I apologized to my sons. And my oldest said, yeah, Dad, you got a little crazy there. You see, there's crazy in every marriage. I just want to let you know that. And the problem is not if you have crazy. The problem is when you act crazy. How many know that? Like kicking garbage, throwing garbage cans around, shoving, screaming, cursing, throwing dishes, throwing pans, throwing stuff. How many know the issue is not if you have crazy because all of us have a little crazy in our family, a little crazy in our lives. But it's all about acting crazy. It's not a sin to be angry, but it's a sin. We can sin while we're angry. And I just want to encourage and let you know that anger unresolved can cause a lot of problems in your marriage. And the main issue with unresolved anger is this. I hope you're taking notes. I hope you're writing this down because this is good. The, what makes unresolved anger damaging in a relationship is that it causes disconnection. Disconnection is the key to any thriving relationship, whether it be a husband or a wife or friendships or parents and children or issues or, or siblings. It's all about connection. Life is about connection. Marriage is about connection. God wants us to stay connected to each other, connected to our spouses. And there are forces coming at us to cause disconnection. And when we have unresolved anger in our souls, unresolved anger in our lives, we become bitter and angry and, and we push away and we become more and more disconnected from each other, from the people we love. You see, life is all about staying connected to God, 
And life is all about staying connected to each other. We have to stay connected to one another. We have to stay in community. We have to stay in connection with God. And notice that when your relationship with God and your connection with God begins to struggle, then all of life begins to struggle. Am I right? And there's nothing worse for me to feel disconnected from my wife. I, I, I just feel like I can't function. I feel like something's wrong. I feel like there's an issue. I feel distant and disconnected from her. And that's what unresolved anger does. So if you're going to stay in love, like Ruth and I have been in love for over 30 years, the key is to stay connected. See, the key to staying in love is to stay connected to your love. Come on, somebody. Is that good? Right? The key to staying in love is to stay connected to your love. You got to stay connected. It's all about connection. And what does anger do? Anger, it's okay to be angry, but when we, anger, when we become angry in sin, it causes disconnection. And when there's disconnection, we open a room to the enemy to come in and cause conflict. Notice the scripture in Ephesians chapter 4 is our passage for today. It says, be angry, but don't sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give, what's that say, church? No opportunity to the devil. I want to tell you right now that your marriage is under attack. Your marriage is under attack. The enemy wants to come in between you and your spouse. Your marriage is under spiritual attack. Why? Because the foundation to every community is the family. The foundation to every healthy community is the family. The foundation to a healthy, a healthy family is a healthy marriage. And the enemy will do what he can to come in between you and your spouse. He's always working. He's always moving. He's always trying to bring conflict. And if we have anger and if we don't resolve that anger and if we sin in anger, then we're giving the enemy an opportunity. That word opportunity in the Greek means place, room, or space. It doesn't mean like room. It means a room. And when you have unresolved anger in your heart, unresolved anger in your life, guess who's living in your home? Guess who's living in your life? Guess who you've given the guest room to in your house? The enemy. It says opportunity is place, room, space. When you give in to anger and don't resolve anger, then what's going to happen is you're going to give the enemy a room or space in your life to take control of your situation, of your marriage. That's why divorce cases are some of the most bitter cases in the world, divorce cases. Um, I was going to say, what, what are those, um, when there's um, relationship issues and the police are called to, domestic issues, right? Domestic violence can be some of the most severe cases. I was just talking to someone who works in the city. He's in the FDNY. He's like, during COVID, the domestic cases have gone crazy. They're just, I haven't seen as many domestic abuse cases as I'm seeing now, and they are bad. We're talking stabbings and shootings and killings. This is what's happening in our world. Why? Because they're controlled by anger. They've given the enemy room in their hearts to, to be influenced by him. And if we're not careful, that anger leads to bitterness and it leads to resentment and then it leads you out the door. A lot of people have hidden anger. They bury their anger. You see, there's two types of people. They have the spewers and the stewers. Any spewers out there, when you get angry, you just spew it out. <laughs> but then there's stewers. Stewers are people who just allow it to stew in their souls. Just push it down until one day it blows up, right? 
But you have to understand that unresolved anger can lead to many things. First of all, unresolved anger can lead to being critical. This is not, this is good for everybody. This is not just for marriage. This is for life. This is, you might have unresolved anger with your boss. You might have unresolved anger with your company. You might have unresolved anger with your neighbor. You might have unresolved anger with your mom. I wish y'all were in church today. I wish y'all were listening. Because you know what I've learned? That the quieter you are, the better I'm doing. Come on, somebody. Because you're like, oh, snap. He's reading my mail. Some of you have unresolved issues with your mom. That's why you're so critical of her or your dad or your family member. Unresolved. Now, there's a difference between a complaint and criticism. There's a difference. For example, let's jump into marriage. Let's jump back into marriage. Um, it's easy for us to become critical in life. It's easy for us to, to, to get a critical spirit. I'm always leery of people that have a lot of criticisms about a lot of other people because very soon they'll be criticizing me. Okay? Critical people. By the way, there's no statues ever built for a critical person. Stay away from critical people. Detach yourself from critical people. Run from critical people. Run from toxic people. Run from people who talk about other people because eventually they'll talk about you. Come on, somebody. I'm just telling you how it is. You don't need your soul to be intoxicated by, by critical people. But criticism is a result of unresolved anger because when you have anger in your heart, you're going to criticize somebody. Now, there's a difference between a criticism and a complaint. When you have a criticism and a complaint, let, let's, let's, use the, let's use the kitchen. Let's use marriage, for example. Let's say you and your spouse agreed that every other day you'll sw- take turns to clean the kitchen. And one day your spouse forgot to clean the kitchen, actually neglected to clean the kitchen, actually went to bed to clean instead of cleaning the kitchen. And your first response, if it results in anger, will be, why do you always forget to clean the kitchen? You never clean the kitchen. You see, a complaint has three parts. I'm sorry. A criticism is what tears a person's character down. It's different than a complaint. A complaint has three parts. Here's how I feel. I'm really angry about a very specific situation. You didn't clean last night. And here's what I need and want and prefer. Could you do it now? So instead of criticizing someone's character, instead of criticizing your spouse, instead of tearing them down, you don't allow anger to possess you. You respond with a complaint. And you speak how you feel rather than showing how you feel with your emotions. You use your words. Don't we teach that to toddlers? Use your words. We seem to have forgotten that in adulthood. We tend to communicate our emotions with emotions. And the best way I've learned to be emotionally intelligent is not to show my emotion. I might have emotion, but to express my emotion with words. This is how I feel. Let's practice that together. This is how I feel. Goes a long way. Honey, this is how I feel. Okay? I'm really angry right now. Can you, can you say it that way? Can you say I'm really angry right now in a calm way? Hey, mom, hey, dad, this is how I feel. I'm really angry right now, and this is why, okay? I'm very angry about this specific situation, and this is what I would need, this is what I want, and this is what I prefer. Ruth and I try to practice this often. We do what we call I notice, I prefer, For example, I notice you keep leaving your clothes in the bathroom on top of the bathtub. Instead of saying, why do you always do that? You're so disorganized. You don't do this. You don't do that. She would tell me, I prefer you put them in the hamper. Follow me on that? When anger goes unresolved, it leads to criticism, not complaint. Criticism has three negative feelings. I'm sorry, has, expresses negative feelings or opinions about the other person's character or personality. 
That's so important to understand. You're attacking a character or personality when you're critical about someone. It's okay to complain, but it's not okay to criticize. Unresolved anger will lead to criticism. Unresolved anger will lead to people to become defensive. Defensive. Defensive is all about protection. It's all about protecting yourself and justifying your behavior. You never get anything accomplished in a relationship when you become defensive. A defensive is a response mechanism that you've learned as a child. It's when you're insulted or attacked. When it could have been when you were a child. It's an automatic reaction that we feel when we are insulted, misunderstood, or attacked. It's that when the walls go up. It's I'm not hearing what you're telling me. I'm not hearing the complaint. I'm interested in protecting myself and justifying my behavior. That's what happens when we become defensive. You cannot have a thriving marriage if you're constantly living and being defensive. You have to be able to listen and hear what the other person is saying, what the other person is needing, what the other person prefers. It requires you to be Humble and it and, and requires you to, to listen. In any relationship, if, if the very first response you have is defensiveness, you're not going to get anything accomplished in that relationship. You see, sometimes our triggers have more to do with our, um, have, have very little to do with our partner and much more to do with the things that made us feel unsafe, unsupported, or unloved as children. That's free. <clears throat> You don't need to go to a counselor's office to hear that one, okay? You don't need to pay $150 an hour to hear that one. That's why it's good to come to church, right? Because many of us don't realize it, but we, defensiveness is a learned behavior that we gain at, as a child in childhood. And when we react and when we become defensive, we're actually projecting the issues we've had as a child to our partner or to our spouse or to, or to our parents or to someone, uh, another relationship that we're in. We do a lot of projection in our marriage, a lot. Unresolved issues with our parents, unresolved issues with family members, trauma from our past, trauma as children. Our brains have been wired and we're reacting not based upon the actual experience or the issue that we're facing. We're responding from issues of our past that go way back to when we were kids. So when someone comes to us with a complaint, immediately we feel um, defensive because we feel unsafe, unsupported, or unloved. It doesn't mean that you're unloved. It just, it's just your feeling of being unloved. That's why, as we said last week, one of the most important things you can bring to your marriage is a person who's being transformed into the image of Christ, is someone who's self-aware of their past, self-aware of how their childhood is impacting their marriage today. It's self-aware and is doing the hard work of discipleship. In order to have a thriving, happy marriage, you have to work on you. The best thing you can bring to your marriage is a transforming you, a person who is being transformed into the image of Jesus, a person who is changing, a person who is encountering Jesus, a person who looks in the mirror and says, Jesus, where do I need to change? Not you need to change. we got to keep going. We don't have a lot of time. So, uh, next, unresolved anger leads us to become distant. That's what happens when we become angry. We cut off. We don't talk to each other. Maybe you walked into church and they put your happy face on, but you are mad as heck at your partner, your spouse right now, right? You're mad and you're smiling and you actually, praise the Lord, Pastor, yes, this is me. Can you just stop talking about this anger because I'm angry. I'm mad as heck. But you don't know what they did to me. You don't know. I, it's true. I don't. But Jesus does. And if we're going to be like Jesus, then we have to learn from Jesus. And Jesus was falsely accused. Jesus was, Jesus was accused and he was mistreated, yet he chose to love. You see, what happens when we become distant is we stonewall. Oh, man, you guys are getting good counseling today. I don't know if you know this. But this is from me. This is like, 
This is, you want to know what I'm going through? This is what I went through. I did a lot of stonewalling. You know how I dealt with situations? I put the walls up. This is Pastor Joe. I become defensive. I get mad and I go to my room. Or I go for a drive. Hours sometimes in the past. Early on in our marriage, sometimes it would be a whole day. Stonewall. And then I would come back home, but I wouldn't talk. I wouldn't talk to my wife. And she would, you see, that's what unresolved anger does. It causes distance and disconnection. And that's what many of us are doing. We're stonewalling. We put the walls up and, and we disconnect and, and, we, and we don't have connection and we, we don't have relationship and, and we, we, we're not courteous. We can't work together and, and we don't even respond to, 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 to cries for help or cries for connection again. And, and, and we just... Go for drives and we don't talk for our spouses. And I've done some marriage counseling in the past or marriage coaching. And what I've heard couples do is sometimes that disconnection, that distance, that stonewalling can last for days. Days. And when you allow the stonewalling to happen in your relationship, guess what you're doing? You're inviting the enemy into your home and giving him a room and say, hey, hang out with us. Hang out with us. Stay, stay here. You can, have a, you can have the guest space here in any relationship. Remember, the enemy's job is to rob, steal, kill, and destroy. Remember, the first church to ever split was not First Baptist in the United States. It was the first church of Jesus Christ in heaven. His main job is to rob, steal, kill, deceive, and to separate. He is the master divider, and he seeks to divide you, and, and he seeks disconnection in your life. So, so this is what couples do. When you stonewall, you're, you're causing distance. You're causing disconnection. And you're giving the enemy a room. So what do we do? Ephesians 4 says, how do we combat these things? How do we combat unresolved anger? Really quick, number one, what do we got to do? We got to say it again. Get rid of it. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander. Wow. Get rid of it. Don't keep it around. The next verse, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, next verse is be kind and compassionate to one another. And doing what? Forgiving each other as Christ and God has forgave you. What does the scriptures tell us? Number one, get rid of it, but also be kind. Be kind. You know what kindness is? Showing love to someone who is testing your patience. Woo. Some of you have a short fuse. Some of you are reactive. You know why? You have so much unprocessed pain from your childhood, from trauma in the past, that you're like a, a fuse. And, and someone does something so small to you, you just triggered, you blow up. And God is saying, no, deal with your anger. Because your anger is not causing, not only is impacting your relationship, your anger is killing you. And anger unresolved eats up all the other good emotions. That's why angry people are not happy people. They don't know how to be happy. All they know is how to be angry. And they look for ang situations that get them more angry because they love anger. Does that, I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. But to, uh, now we, we want to oppose that, right? We want to fight against that, right? What do we do? We got to show kindness. Kindness is selfless, compassionate, merciful. Loving people or testing your patience, showing unconditional love, being, showing mercy, Showing compassion, showing mer being, being merciful. The second thing is be compassionate, thoughtful, thoughtful. Thinking about another person's needs. Thinking about how your spouse feels. Thinking about what they're going through. Show compassion. How do we combat anger? How do we resolve anger? We resolve it by being kind. We resolve it by getting rid of it. We resolve it by being compassionate. Being empathetic. You ever show empathy in your marriage? You also show what Scripture tells us by forgiving. And, and, and that verse is so convicting. It says, forgive as Christ has forgiven you. We not only forgive... Because they deserve forgiveness, we forgive 
because we were forgiven. We were forgiven. That's why we forgive. We forgive the way Christ has forgiven us. Endless, countless times of forgiveness. God has forgiven us. We have to learn how to forgive. We live in an attitude of forgiveness. Well, Pastor, that's hard. I know it's hard. God, it was hard for God to forgive you. <laughs> the cross was hard. Dying on the cross was hard, but God wants forgiveness. Next, we seek to repair. How do we resolve anger? We repair. One of the best things Ruth and I have learned is to repair quickly. Seek connection quickly. You know what I've learned? That repairing requires, repairing requires humility. Humility. Being humble. It's so hard to be the initiator of repair, but I want you to think about Jesus for a moment. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. He initiated repair with us. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Isn't that good? If we're being transformed into the image of Jesus and if we're seeking to reflect Jesus, then guess who has to initiate the repair? We do. We initiate it. We practice it. We humble ourselves in every situation, in every relationship. We humble ourselves. And we say, Jesus, help me to be like you. Because connection with my spouse is more important than being right. Forgiveness is more important than being right. This is a verse that have made my verse. I don't even know if my wife knows this. This verse, this last verse I leave you, Philippians 2, 3, has been a verse that I've used in my marriage for me. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. This is a, a mantra I live by, a verse I live by. Not just in life, but in my marriage. Because in marriage, I'm tempted to think I'm better. In any relationship, you're tempted to think you're better. That leads to contempt. But scripture says you're not better. Consider the other person more significant than you. That's why they're called the significant other. Isn't that good? The reason why they're called your significant other because they're supposed to be more significant than you. That's why in humility, you count them more significant as you. You say, you know what, you're more important than me, your desires, your ambitions. I want you to imagine for a moment a husband and a wife who have that mentality. Think about that. Ruth and I have been practicing this for years. It hasn't been easy. It's been hard at times. But we've gone back to Scripture. We've gone back to practicing humility. We've gone back to practicing repair. We've gone back to these, these principles that we're teaching. I'm teaching you today because they work. Forgiveness. Humility. Repair. I want you to, for a moment as we close, I want you to think about what's missing in your marriage. And don't tell me love. Is it kindness? Is it compassion? Be kind. Is it forgiveness? Is it repair? Is it humility? Stop waiting for your partner to, ex to, to, to demonstrate those characteristics. And how about you? How about you begins with you? Say, Jesus, start with me. Help me to demonstrate these characteristics to my spouse. Help me to be like this to everyone I meet. Isn't that good? Kindness and courtesy can go a long way in this world that lacks kindness and courtesy. Practice kindness. Be kind. How do we become kind? Galatians 5 tells us, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Goodness. Kindness is not originated from us. Kindness is supernatural and is originated by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that good? The Holy Spirit, help me to be kind, compassionate, loving. Some of you 
are full of anger. You have unresolved anger. And God is saying to you today, let it go. Can we bow our heads together? He's saying, let it go. Let it go. Forgive. The anger is eating you up. The anger is causing illnesses. The anger is, is causing pain. The anger is causing disconnection. And God is saying, stop being angry. In anger, do not sin. Be kind, compassionate, forgive, let it go. Let God heal. Lord Jesus, I pray for every marriage, every relationship.